Hello, my name is Rishikesh Kulkarni. I am a statistician at Sitel and head the customer experience group here. Welcome to our on-demand webinar on unconditional test for stratified two binomials. This is the first in a three-part on-demand webinar series featuring new elements from our latest release of StatExact and LogExact, the leading toolkits for exact inference, power analysis, and regression analysis. I'm delighted to introduce my colleague, Ashwini Zoshi, our presenter today. Ashwini is a subject matter expert in mathematics at Cytel. She received an MSc from IIT Bombay, and prior to joining the industry, she was an assistant professor in mathematics at PVG College of Engineering and Technology. In this webinar, Ashwini will review an exact unconditional test that is considered more powerful than the exact conditional test, StatExact already provides unconditional tests of confidence intervals on difference of proportions and confidence intervals on ratio of proportions. In this version of Cytel Studio, uh, we extend the same inferences for stratified data using the com combined confidence distribution method that can be used for meta-analysis. In this presentation, Ashwini will discuss these methods along with some practical case studies. We will conclude with a discussion of some frequently asked questions. I will now hand over to Ashwini. Thank you, Rushikesh. Hello, everyone. I'm going to talk about unconditional exact test for two binomials, unstratified and stratified data. Outline of today's presentation. First, I'll talk about new features in StatExact version 12. Then we'll see exact conditional test for single two by two table or two by two data. Then exact unconditional test for two by two data and the problems we face while implementing unconditional test. Then the more complex part that is stratified two by two data and then the exact conditional and unconditional test for stratified 2 by 2 data. So let us start with the exact products list. Cytel has Cytel Studio as the desktop product for exact methods, or you can say permutational statistics or non-parametric methods. In Cytel Studio, there are three parts. So three products actually, one is stat exact, one then crossover and log exact. In stat exact, two parts are covered, non-parametric analysis and exact power and exact sample size computation for binomial and multinomial data. In crossover, cross, in crossover module, Asymptotic and exact methods for crossover data are covered. And in log exact, various types of regression methods are there. So the regression includes linear regression and generalized linear models for binary data, count data, multinomial data. Log exact also has methods for regression analysis with missing values. Further, Cytel has extended the product with SAS add-ins, so people who are comfortable with SAS can use the SAS add-in of StatExact and LogExact. <clears throat> they are called as exact procs. StatExact methods on SAS are called as StatExact procs, while LogExact methods or regression analysis on SAS, they are called as LogExact procs. The purpose of static site. So when so many asymptotic methods were available, why static site was developed in the first place? Even though in statistics, people have been using asymptotic methods, there are certain cases where we cannot rely on asymptotic inference, like smaller sparse data. When data is small, it doesn't follow the central limit theorem, or data is sparse, that is, there are many zeros in the data, or data has rare events phenomena. In such cases, asymptotic assumptions are not valid. 
and we cannot rely on the inference that is obtained from asymptotic probability distributions. So in general, we can say whenever large sample theory is not reliable, one has to go for permutational inference and that's what we do in StatExact. Here I have listed some new features in StatExact 12. That is the first one that I'm going to talk in this webinar. Unconditional exact test for stratified 2 by 2. There are other exact tests for multiple endpoints. Recently we have developed exact test for negative binomial data. Also we have done power and sample size computation for negative binomial and count data. Among unconditional tests, we have developed a new one for odds ratio. We will visit that also in this webinar. Also, some more power and sample size computations are developed. Now, let us come back to our original topic of two by two data or two binomials data. In clinical trials, we frequently visit such kind of data. We frequently get such kind of data where there are two groups sometimes it is treatment and placebo or two different treatments that we want to compare so group one and group two here you can see and then the response is binary here i've called it as success and failure then the data can be represented in two by two form that is two rows two columns Generally, when we design the clinical trial, the number of patients or number of sorry, number of subjects on each group are fixed. So N1 and N2 are fixed. Here you can see. When an additional condition is there, that number of successes and number of failures are also fixed then we call it as the conditional test. So when we say the row sums and column sums both are fixed, then it is a conditional test. But it is easy to handle. If you see here, row sums and column sums both are fixed, then you have to just enumerate all possible tables and that's what the distribution you get. Let's see what one example. <clears throat> Here I've considered a very small example where row sums and columns are fixed. Also, I've kept them same as 4, 4, but they can be different. So if we want to keep row sum and column sums fixed, the minute we decide the first cell, 1, 1 cell, all other cells get their values automatically, and you can consider this x11 equal to 0 as the representative of the table. So we don't have to actually compute a different test statistic and all. You can just say the first value itself is a test statistic. One can do that. So here you can see it is not a large sample. Only five possible combinations are there. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 correspond to the test statistic and corresponding tables you can see. Using hypergeometric probability, you can also see the probability of observing each table. And depending on the rejection region you want, right tail or left tail p-value, you can compute that by just cumulatively adding the <clears throat> probabilities. So it is a simple case. Generally, people use odds ratio of proportion for conditional test when they want the parameter estimation, that is point and interval estimates. The problem becomes difficult when we have unconditional tests. That means row sums are not fixed. That is, number of successes can vary, and that is very obvious that every time we run the experiment, we are not going to get the same number of successes. So frequently, we see the unconditional test where M1 and M2 are changing, though total N remains the same. But once we start changing M1 also, it doesn't remain the closed form solution the way it was for conditional test. So here again, probability of observing a table Y is shown here. It is just the product of two binomial probabilities that you can see. The problem here is it is probability function defined for Y and depends on two parameters. Delta is the 
effect size that we are interested in. So it could be difference of proportion or ratio of proportion or odds ratio of proportion. And pi 1 is also important here because we are changing the row sum also, that is number of successes. To get inference for only parameter of interest delta, we have to deal with the nuisance parameter pi 1. So in conditional inference also, when we say condition on something, we say there are many parameters and we are interested in some of them. And the remaining parameters which are important, we cannot just ignore them. We have to deal with them, we call them as nuisance parameter. So in this unconditional exact test, what we do is we take the supremum over pi 1. By taking supremum over pi 1, we get the p value independent of pi 1, but the problem is we get the conservative p value. We are taking the supremum, so the highest possible p value, that's what we show. So that is one problem of unconditional exact inference. Next important problem of exact unconditional test that we have to deal with is the confidence intervals may not be nested. So what we expect is 95% confidence interval will be larger than 90% confidence interval. And in asymptotic theory, we always see that happening. But that may not happen in exact case or mainly in unconditional exact test. Second problem we have to deal with is discreteness of the exact distribution. As we have seen, there were only five points in the first example. So it is not a continuous distribution, a nice bell-shaped curve and all. It is a discrete curve. So when you see all the graphs, you don't see a continuous graph, you will see the steps there. So that is the second problem that we have to deal with. I've considered one hypothetical example here for showing you some graphs which will give us more clarity on these two problems. So here's a control and treatment, and here is successes and failures. The data is highly asymmetric. You can see there is only one success in treatment out of 11. Let's see how the asymptotic CIs show the trend for increasing confidence levels. So here on x-axis, we have the effect size. In this case, it is difference of proportion. And on the y-axis, we have the confidence level. You can see as the confidence level is increasing, the CI length is increasing. The confidence interval is increasing. <clears throat> That's what is expected. So in asymptotic CI, you can see the nice trend of increasing confidence interval. If we do the same thing for exact, what happens? At least here on the right or upper CI limit, the trend is quite better, but on left or lower CI limit, you can see there are jumps here. It is not smoothly increasing. Sometimes we even see that the for higher confidence level, the CI is shorter than the earlier one. The reason behind it is the discreteness. When we have a nice, say, bell-shaped curve like this, we easily see that the p-value is either increasing or decreasing for delta. So for the null value, you will have the max value of p-value, and then on both the sides, it's decreasing. But for exact, it's not decreasing always. It is decreasing and going up and coming down like that. We call it as a sawtooth behavior. So when we want to find a particular delta value, which will give us alpha by 2 tail area probability or p-value, we don't get one point. For point 0.025, here you can see there are multiple points which are giving us the value alpha by 2.025. Now, which one is the correct answer for CI limit? <clears throat> Rather, any one of them. But if I say this is the correct answer, then there are some deltas which are going above alpha by 2. So what we have done in StatExact, we have tried to give the largest possible value for upper CI limit 
and the lowest possible value for lower CI limit. So again, that will be a conservative CI, a quite large CI as compared to <clears throat> asymptotic. But at least we can guarantee that after beyond that point, there won't be any delta which will have more p-value or type 1 error. So the solutions we have done are correction for discreteness. As I said, we have tried to show the extreme most numbers or delta values. But when we tried to apply that, the problem was searching the extreme point was time consuming and even using good software like StatExact, it was taking almost four times more time without correction to that of without correction. So we implemented parallel processing using OpenMP. So here you can specify more number of cores if your machine has, if your computer has more number of cores, then you can specify that and perform parallel processing. In general, what we have seen is if you use four cores, then the time required even with correct correction is same as the time which, which was required earlier without correction. So the problem of requiring more time is solved using parallel processing. So these tests were available in static chat for a long time, the conditional and unconditional test for single two by two table. The problem becomes even more complex when the data is stratified. Stratified in the sense we have multiple stratum, there could be multiple studies or multiple sites are there. So in groups we have collected the data. So each group or each stratum gives us a two by two data. And now we want to combine the inference from each group into one. We cannot just pull the data in one table because they are conducted at different time. So we cannot say that the whole data is same and we can have only one two by two data. That is not possible. We have to deal with the stratum part also. The conditional approach that is the traditional method people have been using and StatExact also has the conditional approach for longer time where we just do the separate inference for each two by two data and then we convolute the result into one. So we have asymptotic and exact methods and the effect size is odds ratio. In the recent release of StatExact, we have developed unconditional approach. We have done it for effect sizes, difference of proportion and ratio of proportion mainly. Let's see how we have dealt with unconditional test for stratified data. In this presentation, I'll be using difference of proportion as pi t minus pi c, where pi c is probability of success for control group and pi t is probability of success for treatment group. If there is ratio of proportion, it will be pi t over pi c. And when there is pi without any subscript, it is a probability of response under null. For single two by two table or single two by two data, we have seen the p value will be computed by taking the supremum over the nuisance parameter pi. Then we want to compute the overall effect that is, we have the p-values for each stratum. Now we want to compute the overall effect. Then we compute it using the confidence distribution function. The approach is studied by Liu et al. and they have series of papers on it. So we have referred to that. So they suggest that use the p-value function itself as a confidence distribution and try to combine these distributions together. So let's consider some example. Before that, let's get used to the variables that we are going to use. Here we are showing each stratum, say one, two, up to k, so there are k stratums. If we want a weighted combination, we can also suggest weight. Now for each 
separate stratum for each individual stratum we have the p value function which henceforth will call as confidence distribution function it is denoted by pi for i stratum and the dot is the effect size that we are going to consider it could be difference of proportion or ratio of proportion or odds ratio of proportion <clears throat> so in general what we want to do you can see graphically on the x axis we have delta or the effect size and on y axis we have the p value so for stratum 1 the p value function is something like this you can see it is exact so it is not smooth it is not smooth also it's not always decreasing we have seen that sawtooth kind of behavior this is for stratum 2 and then for stratum 3 finally we want to combine all three together and we want only one distribution function which will help us to get the further inferences so these pi's will come together and form a combined confidence distribution function so this is the combined p value function which is transformed and again applied the inverse transform so here h is the transformation function on p value you can choose the transformation function as you want as far as it is identity it will be a simple weighted sum of probabilities but generally people use different transformation functions and then we apply the inverse transformation but it is not simply inverse transformation it is convolution of inverses so we'll first apply the transformation if we want to use weight use weight and get this weighted combination of transform p values and then apply the inverse transformation and get the combined p value so we'll come back to the p value scale finally now use this p value function and find various inferences if you want point estimate you can find the median from the p value function you can also find the confidence interval confidence interval limits from the p value function and so on so forth again when we are doing the unconditional we have seen the problem now here we are again applying the transformation and convolution in inverse transformation and all the problems that we face are theoretically the confidence distribution function is defined in a way that for a true parameter value the function will remain as function of the sample or the observed data and in that case it should follow uniform zero one which may not happen in the real scenario so this assumption may not be true second problem is further to that because of exact the discreteness also is a problem for that what we have done is we have used the smoothing function for p values using beta function so instead of that sawtooth or discreteness we have got bit smoother p value functions and then we have used it in the same fashion as asymptotic one that is it will follow uniform 01 approximately now let us see some examples the first example here i have considered is nissen data example the example is about rosiglitazone it is a drug for treating patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus and nissen and his team had done the meta analysis for 48 studies so they considered 48 studies where the drug is compared with placebo and they tried to combine the results and get overall effect the 48 studies were randomized control trials they were from phase 2 3 and 4 they were with similar duration between treatment groups and all of them were at least 24 weeks long the claim made by the meta analysis was 
This drug increases the risk of MI, that is myocardial infarction, and CV deaths, cardiovascular cause deaths. So even though the drug is good for diabetes, they are, the drug is increasing the risk of MI and CV. That's the claim made by Nissen and T. The problems in this meta-analysis were, there were total 48 studies, out of which 23 reported at least one CV death. On remaining studies, no event was reported for both the arms. So in the meta-analysis, only those 23 studies were considered where at least one CV death is reported. When there is no event on both the arms, meta-analysis considered that it is not informative. Actually, that was not the case. If there is no event, that means both the treatments are behaving same. Both the treatments are giving the similar results. So we cannot say it is no information. It also gives some information. So one should not exclude those studies where no event is observed. Initially, meta-analysis was performed with only asymptotic inference. And asymptotic inference, if without continuity correction is used, then asymptotic inference will consider only those 23 studies because asymptotic methods cannot handle both zero events for two by two data. <clears throat> so initially when asymptotic inference was done for 23 studies, it showed that the drug has significant effect on the two endpoints. That is, drug is significantly sorry. asymptotic inference showed that the drug is significantly increasing the risk of the endpoints. While when exact inference was conducted, as exact inference doesn't need any continuity correction, it considered all 48 studies. Now let's see how we can do this exact analysis in StatExact. So I have opened here Cytel Studio. And I have also opened the <clears throat> Nissen data. In Cytel Studio, you can see here is the main menu. This non-parametric stands for static set. So non-parametrics and power and sample size computation. Then regression is for log exact. And here is the crossover, what we have seen earlier. <clears throat> I've already opened or invoked the Nissen data here. You can see here is the strata or study ID. So there are 48 studies. Population here again 0 and 1 is used for group 1 and 2. Response is also binary 0 or 1. There is death as an event or no event. And here is the frequency of MI and frequency for cardiovascular deaths. So with no response, that means no death, you can see the numbers are quite large. But when we see control group and response one, many of the events are zero, you can see here. <clears throat> but the same thing is observed when population is one, that is treatment, and response is death, still there are many zeros. So it's not that only control group is showing less deaths, even the treatment is showing rare events. Let's see how to execute this. You can see here is the inference for categorical data. In two independent binomials, we have the conditional procedures and unconditional procedures, which we talked about. So in conditional procedures, various methods are there and the parameter estimation is done only for odds ratio though the test statistic can be fisher exact it could be pearson chi-square or likelihood ratio 
in unconditional we have the bernard test bosch lewis test and then ci on difference ratio and odds ratio of proportion which is recently developed but we are not interested in only two independent binomials we are interested in stratified 2 by 2 so let's go to stratified 2 by 2 tables the first two are for conditional test or ratio and next two are unconditional test for difference of proportion and ratio of proportion so i'll open ci on difference of proportion input screen here are the variables which we want to use and here we'll want to in here we want to enter binary response so i'll add the response variable then the population variable then we want to add strata stratum variable and the frequency so you can choose any one of them if you use asymptotic only then it will simply use the asymptotic method but we are interested in exact so we will use the exact method here are the various p value combination method when we, i say the, there is a transformation and inverse transformation so there we need various functions the transformation so the transformation could be inverse normal it could be logit it could be fisher min p or max p so how you want to combine the p values so you can choose one of these methods and in options tab you can specify what is your response value also in general tab you can specify various other options what kind of confidence interval you want so you can specify the confidence level if the data is large enough that it cannot be computed in 5 minutes or so you can specify the time limit you can specify the memory limit for exact procedure in this case i'll not click okay because it's a large data and it may take longer so i have already saved the data i'll take you back to the presentation and here are the results if we would have done asymptotic without continuity correction then only 23 studies will be considered and the point estimate will be 0.0012 you can see the p value is really small less than 0.05 and one can immediately infer that the difference in placebo and treatment is significant or that particular drug is significantly creating higher risk than placebo also the ci limits you can see zero is not included in the confidence interval so p value and confidence interval both suggest that the drug is significantly increasing the risk of cardiovascular deaths while in exact all 48 studies are considered the p value is huge um p value lies in 0 to 1 so you can say p value is huge but we have already seen the exact p value is the max possible p value that can be obtained we have taken the supremum everywhere so it is large but still we cannot expect it to be less than 0.25 also the confidence limits you can see zero lies in the confidence interval it's minus 0.02 and plus 0.02 so exact method says there is no significant difference in drug and the placebo or the drug is not significantly increasing the risk of cardiovascular deaths further to that after a few years nissen and his team had to again publish a modified meta analysis where they accepted that they had not considered some some studies which they should have considered and they had to publish the results asymptotic inference with continuity correction here are the references that we used while developing the test the first one which i said liu et al for exact meta analysis tian 
and Liu had also started developing a procedure, but they used sampling instead of actual exact distributions, but the method was similar. Rommel's paper we used for correcting that sawtooth behavior, and all the theories available in SAT exact manual, so that reference is also given. So thank you. If you have any questions, please contact us at support at .com. In this session now, we'll discuss some frequently asked questions. Over to Roshikesh. Thank you very much, Ashwini, for this informative presentation. Uh, we are now going to discuss uh, some commonly asked questions on this topic. So the first question is, uh, Ashwini, mm -hmm. uh, can you explain briefly uh, the biggest mm -hmm. uh, difference between unconditional and conditional inference? And, and a related question, are there any specific cases when one should prefer unconditional over conditional? Yeah. So conditional is the nice situation which we all would like, would like that we have fixed uh, number of patients in each group and the same number of successes we'll observe every time. Right? So I'll go back to the slide. So we'll observe the same number of successes, but which rarely happens. Right? So if it is observational study, you already know that nothing else is going to happen, then yes, you can rely on that. People do use conditional inference whenever there is odds ratio of proportion as the effect size because they are mainly interested in odds of one or treatment over other. But when you, your effect size is difference of proportion or ratio of proportion, then you have to see what happens when every time you run the experiment. So the group total could be fixed, but the actual observed number of successes will be different. So in such cases, we have to rely on unconditional tests. OK, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you did mention, uh, this is the second question, you did mention the use of open MP uh, yeah. to improve the performance uh, in the latest version of uh, StatExact. Uh, yes. Have you con compared the performance across a single core and, and multi core computers? And if yes, uh, what were your findings in terms of, terms of the performance improvement? Yes. So, as I said, because of that discreteness correction, we needed extra time. So, if we use single core with that correction, then whatever time is required, it is almost four times more than the earlier one without correction. So that was the extra time that was required for uh, correction of discreteness. But when we started using the OpenMP, and mm, generally speaking, I'm telling what trend we have seen, if there are four cores, then you can again get back to the, your original performance. So whatever extra time was required, that is four times more, we could handle with four cores. But you can Excellent. use even more cores. Generally, up to eight cores, we have seen the performance getting better and better. So as you increase number of cores, your computations will be done faster. Excellent. That's that's a substantial uh, you know, improvement on the performance. Well, thank you again, Ashwini. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for listening to our on-demand webinar. Uh, don't forget to check out the other webinars in this series uh, on uh, tests for multiple endpoints with gatekeeping procedures test of non-parametric combination, as well as the third one, uh, which is on saddle point approximation method uh, by visiting www.sitel.com. To learn more about StatExact and LogExact, please do visit our website, www.sitel.com uh, slash uh, software. We're concluding this session now. Thank you very much. Thank you.